police officers of Reddit, who's the smartest criminal you've ever encountered. Most of them are really stupid so this guy isn't a criminal mastermind but here goes. He wanted to rob a jeweler's on our city's main street. So he found out the flat beside the jeweler's was empty and he hid there. For two weeks he triggered the alarm on purpose several times a night, massive headache for the police and the business, we turned up to see nothing there, nothing on cameras, thought it was just a fluke so the jewelers turned off the alarm system and said they'd wait until the morning to get a new one installed or that one rewired because something wasn't right. As soon as he heard that and the police leaving he tore down the wall, had already been working on this apparently, and robbed the place taking his sweet time. Escaped without anyone noticing anything for hours until the jewelers came back in the morning. Then he tried to resell something he stole which had a serial number on it and got caught. So not that smart after all. Good effort though. He did all the hard work pretty well. AI'd the hardest part about stealing high dollar goods is selling the merch. Edit, of course my top comment is about criminal activity. Thanks Reddit. Guy I went to high school with kept selling this gold necklace under a fake ID to jewelry stores. When he had cash in his hand from the sale, he'd flash a real looking airsoft gun and demand the necklace back. Worked about twice until the third guy knew what the deal was if someone tried selling this one particular necklace. Shop owner went in the back to reference an appraisal book and just called the cops. Funny part was he got like a year for the robberies, but using the fake gun added 5 years to the sentence. Never rob a bank with a weapon. You'll be out in like a year or less if you get caught. Edit. Sellers are trained to treat all robbers as though they are armed and to comply with their demands and get them out of the bank ASAP. Money is insured. Banks would rather lose a bunch of cash than deal with legal ramifications of an injured or K-led employee. If you show up and tell the teller you're robbing them, they will probably give you the money quicker and more calmly than if you stuck a gun or knife in their face. A friend of my brother moved to Israel where for a period of time it was is acceptable to drive with an American driver's license. He was pulled over for speeding, and when asked for his license, gave the officer his Costco card. Costco is a membership-based retail warehouse in the US and a few other countries. The exchange apparently went something like this, Officer, Costco? What is Costco? Friend, it's the state I'm from. Officer, that sounds made up. Friend, there are lots of states you probably haven't heard of. Have you heard of Arkansas? How about Idaho? Officer? I guess not. Friend, well I'm from the small state of Costco. The officer didn't have a response and wound up writing the ticket to someone with a Costco driver's license. Friend framed the ticket and still has it hanging on his wall. Reminds me of a family friend of mine, very funny Australian with an absolutely horrendous spoken accent. Well late 80s he's driving through Texas and runs a red light, and is immediately pulled over by a 250 pounds Texan police officer with an equally horrendous accent, the way the stories goes this man is obviously not the brightest chap. So our friend, when asked about running the red light, gets very apologetic and explains that he gets easily confused because in Australia, you know how things are reversed down there, red means go and green means stop. The cop actually let this man go with a warning I did not know that. Well in America, red means stop, so don't make this mistake again. Well. There was this one guy, we'll call him Jack. Now, Jack stole stuff but also involved a lot of people. One time, he was planning to steal a whole bunch of cars, all luxury cars. So what he did, was he got his people to call 911, etc., from all different places, and countries to tell them that car theft was taking place in multiple places. Oh, he also only used a few people each time, so it was different voices, people, locations, etc. So the police went each time, until he actually did the crime, then no one came. He was never caught. When the owner of those cars came, the police didn't believe him. Ten tenths genius right there. He sort of used the boy who cried wolf story in real life to his advantage. The damn wolf learned to cry wolf. The story goes like this, a homeowner walks out one morning to drive to work only to find his car missing. He reports the car stolen to police. A few days later, his car is sitting back in front of his house. When he gets inside he finds a note. 
It was an apology that said the thief was in dire need of quick transportation and so he borrowed the first car he found with the keys inside. The writer noticed the sticker on the car for the local sports team, and just so there were no hard feelings, he left four tickets to an upcoming game in the glove box for the homeowner and his family. So the homeowner and his family attend the game, but when they return home they find the house has been ransacked and all items of value are gone. That's pretty smart, but I feel like the police would be able to look up the ticket stubs and see who bought them, if bought online, or with a credit, debit card. Alternatively, if they were bought with cash they could probably coordinate the ticket sales with a camera. Maybe I'm overestimating the investigative power of the police, but I feel like that's the route I would go if I was a detective. Even if the tickets were resold, you'll still be able to find the original owner and potentially see who they sold the tickets to. There was a guy with over 50 speeding charges, with the name Pra Wajazdi. He was in a different car, with a different disguise every single time. Eventually, after the government set up a special task force to take down this guy, they realized that Pra Wajazdi means driver's license in Polish. Clarification. It was 50 different people, the police just wrote down their name as Pra Wojazdi every time someone with a Polish driver's license was caught speeding. It is very similar to Fandom of Heilbronn. German police were looking for a serial killer who had left DNA traces at over 40 crime scenes all over Europe only to find that the DNA belonged to a woman who worked at the factory that made the cotton swabs used for collecting DNA samples. Jesus Christ that would be so deflating to be working the case and come to that conclusion. Pretty clever for the serial killer to get a job at the cotton swab factory. Imagine how long she must have been planning her serial killing career for to play that long game. There's a small tourist town where I grew up that is divided in half by a big river, the only way between the two sides is over a long bridge, unless you go all the way around another mountain pass. These guys called in, like. 2-3 bomb threats to a posh hotel on one side of the bridge, I think they even left some dummy packages. All the police went across the bridge to do crowd control, etc, etc. The guys then called in a bomb threat on the bridge. And started robbing stuff on the other side. The police couldn't be positive the bomb threat was real or not and hesitated long enough to give the thieves a head start. I first heard this story about 10 years ago, in Banff, Alberta. Never bothered to look up what was real versus what is invented. I think this is pretty close. But as my father used to say, you can't let truth get in the way of a good story. Wow, 24k upvotes? Thanks folks. Here's one. I knew this guy back in the early 80s, let's call him Jim. Well he really wanted this high powered super bike but he knew he couldn't ever afford it. So what he did was to take drive to London and scouted about for a few days until he found that particular model parked outside a house. He goes back that night with a slide hammer, pulls the lock, and steals the bike. He gets it home, puts it in his garage and completely strips it so that the only thing left is the frame and the bottom half of the engine, which he drags into the weeds at the bottom of his garden, then he pours fuel over it and burns it a bit. A few weeks pass and weeds have started growing over it. It's at that point he calls the cops and reports that someone had dumped a bike frame in his garden. The cops show up and he explains that he just got back from being away and found it. The cops take the frame and note down high name and address. A few days later, the cops call him and say that the bike had been stolen from London a month or so ago, from the serial number on the bottom half of the engine and frame, and that the insurance company had classed the bike as a write-off, and had told the cops to dispose of it. Now, because the frame was found in his garden and the insurance company didn't want it, the cops were duty bound to ask him if he wanted to keep it, or if they should throw it. So he tells them that he'd always wanted to build a bike. He gets the fame back from them, repaints it, then puts it all back together and re-registers it as a Q-Reg, stolen and recovered. I forgot to call him Jim didn't I? I always laugh when somebody names a character and then proceeds to never use the name. Nice catch. Working in a home improvement store when younger. This guy came in, went to the snow blowers, took one and went to the return desk. Said he wanted to return it but had no receipt. They told him you need a receipt so he says ok I'll be back and wheels it off to car through the front door. He did this a few times apparently. 
couple places even helped him load it back into his car. Had a guy try that with the big expensive bedding sets at Sears back 20 years ago. He came up the escalator empty handed, walked into the first aisle, and came out carrying the set. He said he wanted to return it, I said I needed a receipt and when he asked why, I explained, well sometimes we have issues with people coming up here, taking stuff off the shelves and trying to return it. He got a bit squirrely, looked around kinda panicked and left with it. On the way to the door, security started following him so he threw it at them and sprinted out to do. Obligatory not a cop, but. Close on 20 years ago now a guy on Australia's Gold Coast got away with a bank robbery in broad daylight. He cased the bank for a while and discovered a pattern of the bank manager arriving about 30 minutes before anyone else each morning where he would leave the front doors unlocked so staff could help themselves in without a key or needing to wait for the boss to come and let them in. One morning the crook dressed himself up for a busy day of office work and waited for the bank manager to arrive. As the manager was unlocking the doors he made his move, entering the building and threatening the manager with a gun. He got all the details he'd need to access the vault and so forth and then tied the manager up and stuffed him in his office. When the staff arrived he told them that the manager had called in sick and that regional office had sent him in to do the open shop thing and no one batted an eyelid. This bank had a small walk-in vault that normally only held about 30-50k on any given day but Old Mate had a timed his robbery for the morning after business banking day when all the local small businesses would make their end-of-week deposits and reportedly got a score of close to 250k. Once the vault was open he pulled his gun out and invited all the staff to enter the vault and locked them in. By this stage the bank was due to be open so when he went to leave there were a number of customers waiting to get inside to do their banking. He told them all that there had been an issue with the computers and that the tech team had estimated it would take about 30 minutes before the issue would be resolved and that they couldn't open until then. Then he got into his car and drove straight to the airport and flew to Hong Kong and then disappeared. To my knowledge the cops never caught him and never managed to find the money, they knew he'd have had to leave most of it in Australia somewhere because you can only take 10k odd in cash in any currency out of the country before customs pulls you into their interview room so the assumption was that he had to have an accomplice here who would funnel the money to him slowly over time. Edit, for those wondering, he was identified later after witness statements and CCTV led to his getaway car being discovered at the airport where he boarded a plane destined for Hong Kong which is as far as they could track him. That's a lot of trust to put in one person who's in another country from you, and with leverage over you. It'd be really smart in this situation to use an immigrant from Hong Kong to funnel the money back. Ideally an immigrant with family back in Hong Kong. Funnel the payments as sending money to your family back home, which is super common anyways. The thief gives a percentage to the family or maintains their lifestyle in exchange for the transfers. Now the funneler has leverage over the thief in the form of his known whereabouts. The thief has leverage over the funneler by taking care of the latter's family. Mutually assured destruction if either ever flips. Homeless guy in my hometown figured out if he committed some act of petty theft he'd get a night in jail, a warm place to sleep and a hot meal. He'd show up, turn in his stolen goods and that would be that. After a while the police would just tell him to take back whatever he stole the next day. Quite the town character. Lots of people try to get arrested on purpose for the same reason. I've done it before, to try to escape an abusive relationship. FYI trying to get arrested is super fun. Edit, this is my biggest post wow ha ha. To answer the questions I'm getting all in one place, yes I escaped from that guy 3 or 4 years ago. To get arrested I'd just be really careless. I was homeless, and addict and mentally ill and very very sad and angry so I'd just let those emotions out. i drink in public and when I got caught I'd throw my drink at the cops, if they ever tried to detain me I'd fight back, I was barely 100 pounds at the time, couldn't do much harm luckily breaking things, stealing things, getting in fights I knew I'd lose. I'd usually just go in for like a weekend or a few days or whatever and he'd always be at the doors waiting for me when I got out. The ladies in jail I met always took care of me and I met some wonderful people. Luckily I'm a white woman living in Canada so nothing escalated to me being harmed. I realize I have a ton of privilege to be able to act a damn fool in front of cops and live to tell the tale with no serious lasting repercussions. Probably someone who committed a crime I never solved. 
With that being said I had a guy use a sledgehammer to smash his way through a wall at a Best Buy and steal a bunch of phones and cameras. He was smart enough to wear gloves and a face mask and not touch anything he didn't have to. Alarms didn't go off until he exited out the back door, which the alarm company gets after a minute or two and takes them like three-fourths minutes to call in to us, giving him a good five-minute head start so he was probably a few miles away before we got dispatched to it. He clearly scoped out the area before doing his deed too. Smart dude. Edit, so part of the building was built into a hill, so the hole was on the back side of the building along the grade line but when you're inside the building it was about 8 feet up, so it was easier for him to leave out a door. Also the wall section where he broke through was hollow cement block, the portion of the wall below that was poured concrete. 